Our next, or second, yeah, next, scripture reading comes from Paul's letter to the church in Rome in Romans chapter 8. I've often said I will be happy to preach on Romans. I would never do Romans for a grade. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, hear the word of the Lord. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For this hope, we are we're saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He also called. Those He called, He also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <clears throat> I share this story by Phyllis Tickle. She wrote in God Talk in America. Does the earth have an outer edge? People believe that it did for centuries. If you went beyond it, you'd fall off. Does the universe have an outer edge? That question, too, goes back to the ancient Greeks particularly Plato's colleague, Archides, the Pythagorean. All, Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity finally gave a solution to this problem when it was published in the spring of 1916. The theory showed how the universe could contain a finite number of stars in a finite amount of space, but still not be closed or have an edge one could fall off. As it were, Einstein demonstrated mathematically that matter warps space. In the process, the galaxies would be wrapped around one another to form a sphere, so that if one could travel far enough, fast enough, one would eventually return to one starting point, just as on the Earth itself. If that was too simple, the universe could also have a hyperbolic form, but that too could be traversed in a way that returned one to the starting point. At this point, I hope you're as confused as I am. Are you? Good. Einstein's mathematics were of an awesome beauty. Physicists wanted to believe them, but would they hold up if they were tested against some observable event? The chance to make such a proof came three years later, when a solar eclipse would occur on May 29, 1919, observable only from the Southern Hemisphere. The British astronomer Arthur Stanley Eddington organized an expedition to Prince Island, which lies off the west coast of Equatorial Africa. If Einstein was right, if... The briefly darkened sky ought to reveal a distortion in the apparent position of the stars. And indeed, Eddington's experiment, as well as another conducted simultaneously in Brazil, found that the distortion not only existed, but conformed almost exactly to the degree predicted by the theory. The confirmation of this theory almost immediately made Einstein the most famous scientist on Earth. He went on to become a beloved public figure. But Einstein was not quite as cuddly as the public liked to believe, and was certainly not given to false modesty. When asked what he would have done if Eddington's expedition had failed to prove the theory of relativity correct, Einstein replied, I would have had to pity our dear Lord. The theory is correct. Imagine that. Einstein cocky enough to know that he's right and God's wrong. Sounds like a human, doesn't it? 
So this morning I'm continuing my tirade, my journey through things that really aren't in Scripture per se. The phrase I want to deal with this morning is, and we like this phrase and it sounds really good, and it's partially true, God works in mysterious ways. We love that one. And we've used it for centuries. God works in mysterious ways. <clears throat> Ancient people, hundreds, thousands of years ago, when they would see something that they couldn't explain, they would say, it's the will of God, whoever their God was. It's an interesting dynamic. Why did that book fall? Not a rhetorical question. Why did the book fall? Gravity! Gravity! What if I suddenly said that was the will of God? Would that be so hard to understand? Give me one. I don't want the mathematical equation either. I'm blowing over the top of the paper. Why did it come up? Keep going. What's the equation? <laughs> oh, come on. Hold on. But this paper comes up, but that one doesn't. Maybe it's the will of God. It's not the way I'm holding it. It's the air going over the top. You're about to get an engineering education when you get home, I bet. <laughs> I can't, I'm not a scientist. I think it's called cool. Oh, I don't want to trip on that. Now you can clean up after <laughs> <laughs> There are people today who choose to ignore science. And I'm not a scientist, but I do love reading about this stuff. And I've read I'm constantly reading things about dinosaurs. Um, a couple Christmases ago, some of my family got me a book about the history of dinosaurs. Now, I'm not going to go into details this morning because y'all want me to you know, kind of get through this morning so we get to lunch. But I can tell you, after reading that book, I will never look at birds the same way. You know what I'm talking about. Birds are scary now. I've read most of the works by Neil deGrasse Tyson, and they're fascinating. Imagine, if you will, all the universe, all the stars, all the planets, all the energy, all the matter fitting on the tip of a pen. And say understood it. But science is phenomenal. The things we learn. Yes, I will argue that that is the will of God because God created. But God organized chaos. That's why the book doesn't fall up. For centuries, we have used the will of God language to explain away that which we do not understand. And it's convenient. It's simple. It is also a roadblock. For God also gave us reason. God has created the universe, a place rich in puzzles to be solved gravity, the flight, the human behaviors. We all do stuff for a reason. We might say, well, they just do things. No, there's a reason. And these things can be studied. And it's fascinating. So yes, God does things in mysterious ways, but not to be ignored. The mystery is that we don't understand. Prior to coming to New Hope, I was sitting in my construction trailer one day, and this guy comes in, and he was a really nice guy. He really was. He had a great heart. He was a phenomenal individual. Loved having conversations with him. And he came in, and I don't know what I said to start this conversation. I wish I could remember so I don't do it again. But we started talking about dinosaurs. And he looked at me, and he says, Brian, you know dinosaurs didn't really exist. That got my attention real fast. I was like, excuse me? And he said, no, they didn't exist. I mean, read the Bible. They're not in there. I'm like, OK. 
Okay? The Bible was kind of put together after the dinosaurs, this would be my understanding. You're welcome to contradict me if you'd like. So I asked him, I said, how do you figure with all the evidence that dinosaurs weren't real? He says, well, imagine a work of fiction. The author writes this book and they create a false history. So his theory is that God has planted false seeds for us to find to create a false history. And it's, it's a fascinating conversation. I gotta give it credit, so don't, don't yell at me too much. His argument has some merit, I believe. But my response to him is, okay, if your argument is true, why did God have to lie? That conversation ended very quickly. God is the mystery. The universe is a puzzle. We have been granted the ability to reason sort through, to study, to observe. I think all people have a certain curiosity, especially when you see children, especially when children have been well-napped and well-fed. Then they ask you a thousand questions. Sometimes in adulthood we lose that. God works, I would argue, in predictable ways when we look and pay attention. God's not here to surprise us. not here to shock us. That's the first problem I have with that phrase. God works in mysterious ways. It becomes a cop-out. Gives us reason not to understand gravity. To understand science. Well, God willed it. That's all I need to know. So that's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is very, very, very simple. <clears throat> I'm a theologian by job description now. And theologians are notorious, you two are welcome to agree or disagree, for complicating theology. Am I correct, Peg? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Bill, would you agree with that? Theologians complicate theology? Yeah. I can prove it. <clears throat> because if you go into my office, there are more books than I, than I want to count, all tied to theology on some level. Theologians, we get a hold of a sentence from the Bible and we want to write a series of books on it. PhDs might do it for other stuff too, but I'm only picking on theologians today. I'm going to simplify this whole process. It might cost me my job, I hope not, but I'm going to simplify it. Because I do believe God is not out to confuse us any more than we confuse ourselves. What we are to do, how we are to live, is summed up. I can sum it up in two words love others. Love others. Jesus says that all the law is built upon these two commandments love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and your mind, saying, Go in and love your neighbor as yourself. Let's simplify that love others. Now, we want to go, we want to take that. Theologians and people in general go, well, what about? No, no, no. Love others. What about people that don't look like me? Love others. What about criminal? Love others. It's not a mystery. It's not. Walk up to most people. Get within six feet of them. And smile at them. They'll smile back. Unless things are really wrong. And then you've got an opportunity to love others. We spend a lot of time trying to complicate, to create a mystery out of this thing we call life, out of the scripture. God works in mysterious ways. No, God has organized chaos. We create a mystery where there's not one. Or, maybe even worse, we fail to pursue the truth. The truth is, the universe is a playground for us. We study it, we dug up, treasures to be found. All things work according to a design. The fundamental humanity, people everywhere, to 
it's love. When we love others, we feel good. We have more energy. Days go better. But things like hate, anger, frustration, those things wear us down, beat us up, make us want to run and hide. God, I believe, does not work in mysterious ways. I believe God is a mystery. One that we, as mere mortals on planet Earth, will not solve. For if the mystery of God could be solved, God would not be God. But God has put us in a place where we can figure things out. Like a parent leaving treasures for their children to find. Everything has a reason, everything has a cause. At the heart of all of it, in the simplest terms, we're called to love others. I'll share one more thing this morning. In her book, God Talk in America, Phyllis Tickle observes that the blurring of the line between science and theology can be very beneficial to all parties. She recalls St. Augustine's words, Oh God, help me to believe more, so that I may understand more. And she reports that Carl Sagan, there's a genius, one of the best loved of the most of the early popularizers of science, reflect on his ongoing process in his book, The Demon Haunted World. Science is a candle in the dark. When he writes of science as a profound source of spirituality, because it's revelations of the intricacy, the beauty, and the subtlety of life lead to that soaring feeling, that sense of elation and humility combined. That forsaken is indeed spiritual. Friends, the more I study, the more I read, the more I learn, the more I believe in God. And frankly, the more I'm able to love, the more I believe. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, let us never cease to pursue you, the mystery of you. But let us also accept the challenge and the joy and the blessing of understanding of creation and of loving others. Let our hearts be lightened in your presence. Let us be filled and renewed that we may long last travel the universe and find ourselves again. Mighty God, in our journey, let us daily find you and rejoice in all these things we pray in your name.
before I get too far along, I want to thank Janet. I love when World Communion Sunday is beautiful up here. Take a moment to reflect on those words, World Communion Sunday. Where we, a little happy family of faith here at New Hope, are gathered in this place and this time. To think, if you will, millions upon millions around the world this day. Africa, Europe, Asia, Australia, all types of people, all pigmentation of skin, all walks of life, rich, poor, male, female, PhDs, and those who have not had the opportunity for an education, the hungry, those who have been a big breakfast gathering at this table. Imagine it, if you can. Imagine it, if you will, how wonderful that is. People coming together, being loved, being nourished in the Spirit. This is our Lord's table. All the good things given by His hand. This is not a Presbyterian table. Roman Baptist or Catholic or anybody else's. This is our Lord's table. And he bids all who call on it to come. For they are welcome at this feast. That they may be nourished. Nourished in love. Nourished in body and in spirit. So let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is so right to give our thanks and praise. It is so right to turn our eyes to the one who created the stars, the galaxies, the earth, who has blessed our sight with mountains and oceans, family and friends. He gives us the very air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. It is so right to turn our eyes upon Jesus, who bids us come, who blesses us with the mission of love. How blessed we are to serve God and serve one another. We gather this morning at your table, O oh God. We gather as friends and family. We gather as one. Be served, be nourished, be lifted up, be fortified. We may serve one another with your eyes. Loving God, in the midst of thanking you for the countless blessings, we also bow our heads as we also are bent from our burdens. It seems every day there's more yelling, more screaming, more anger. We cry out, when will it end? Remind us gently, O oh Lord, that we too must control our anger. That we too must be loving. We're reminded that we love because you first loved us. Because you have loved us. Grant us the courage and the wisdom to love others. Lord Jesus, we do ask that this pandemic be brought to an end. We do ask for a cure for cancer. We do ask that through your spirit, love prevails, that poverty, hunger, and homelessness may be eliminated, that the captives, the abused and the neglected can be set free. We do ask that your people be touched, that their eyes be opened, that the walls and barriers be brought low, bridges built, that all people may come to know you as Lord, may come to realize that we are all your people. Loving God, we do continue to pray 
Ready? Berlin. So many others. We give thanks for good news. And we await your works. Lord Jesus, each of us here this morning has a joy to celebrate a, a birthday, an anniversary, a visit from a loved one, a joy to give thanks for. But each one of us also has a pain we would ask you to alleviate. We ask that you now hear our hearts as we praise our Lord. God, you have heard the prayers of our hearts as individuals. We ask now that you hear us with one voice, praying as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. As our Lord sat in that upper room at a feast, a table, with his disciples, he called friends. And I will grant I probably say that every month, how powerful that is. That when the one says, I call you friends, you're elevated to something beyond what you can imagine. Our Lord took the bread and held it up saying, this, this is my body. This is my body. This is my body. Broken for you. Do this. Remembrance to me. In the same way he took the cup for now saying, this is the sign of the new covenant. Sealed my blood shed for the sins of humanity. And he told his friends that he would not partake of the fruit of the vine again until he comes again. But that we are to do so. For to do so in his very real presence here and now. But to do so in remembrance. And we're to do so joyfully resting in the comfort of his promise to come again. The gifts of God for you. Feel called. Come forward. Receive the gifts of God. <clears throat> 